Coming up on this Monday edition of Daybreak, North Korea launches two short-range Scud missiles into the East Sea in an apparent show of force ahead of Chinese President Xi Jinping's visit to Seoul later this week. The Korean government will change scores of regulations and systems across a range of government departments. The changes will take effect in the second half of the year. Plus, more than 100 workers are still feared trapped following a building collapse in the southern Indian city of Chennai. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us to our viewers around the world. It's 6am on Monday, June 30th. Here in Seoul, I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. Our top story this morning, the South Korean military is on high alert after North Korea on Sunday launched two short-range Scud missiles into the East Sea. The firings are thought to be a show of force ahead of a visit by Chinese President Xi Jinping to the South later this week. Hwang sang reports. North Korea fired two short-range missiles off its eastern coast early Sunday morning, the second such launch in less than a week. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said the weapons fired were Scud missiles that flew about 500 kilometers from the vicinity of Wonsan into the East Sea. An official from the Joint Chiefs of Staff said North Korea did not give any prior warning of the launch for civilian flights or vessels. The South Korean military believes the missiles to be SCUD-C or SCUD-ER missiles. SCUD missiles are liquid-propellant ballistic missiles that have a range covering the entire Korean peninsula. North Korea has fired 11 short-range missiles this year, and Sunday's launch marks its fourth ballistic missile launch. In February, it fired four ballistic missiles believed to be SCUD-B missiles. And in March, it launched two missiles presumed to be SCUD-C or SCUD-ER missiles into the East Sea. Experts say the latest launch is a military demonstration aimed at drawing the attention of the international community ahead of Chinese President Xi Jinping's upcoming visit to South Korea this Thursday. The South Korean military has heightened its vigilance and beefed up its military readiness against any additional provocations by Pyongyang. Hwang sang Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye will likely name General Han Ming-gu as the nation's defence minister following his confirmation hearing on Sunday. The Defence Committee of the National Assembly agreed that General Han was qualified to serve as the nation's defence chief. At his confirmation hearing on Sunday, Han vowed to install the country's indigenous missile defence system as soon as possible to counter any North Korean threats. Han also said he would make it clear to Pyongyang that it will never get any concessions through military provocations and threats. Other key nominees for key government posts will likely undergo confirmation hearings in the coming weeks. Chinese President Xi Jinping has vowed that no violations of territorial integrity will be tolerated and says no nation should be allowed to monopolize global affairs. Watchers say his comments can be seen as a thinly veiled attack on the United States. Kim Min-ji reports. Chinese President Xi Jinping has stressed that the sovereignty and territorial integrity of a nation should be respected. His comments came during an event marking the 60th anniversary of a mutual peace agreement between China, Myanmar and India. The 1954 Five Principles of Peaceful Coexistence call for mutually respecting sovereignty and territorial integrity as well as mutual non-aggression and non-interference in domestic affairs. Sovereignty and territorial integrity should not be infringed upon. This is a basic principle that should not be ignored. The comments come as China is locked in territorial disputes with neighboring countries such as Japan, the Philippines and Vietnam. In a national meeting late last week, the leader said China should not forget its humiliating past as a victim of foreign aggression and call for stronger border defense. It was seen to target Tokyo in particular, which has been at odds with Beijing over territorial as well as historical disputes.
He also stressed that China will not seek hegemony no matter how strong it becomes. China does not acknowledge the notion that a country will seek hegemony when it grows in strength. Hegemony or militarism is not the genes of China. The Chinese leader also said the right of a country to choose its own social system and path of development should be respected. That remark was seemingly his way of telling the West to keep out of China's domestic affairs. The Chinese president, however, did not mention North Korea's nuclear weapons or the Korean Peninsula during his speech. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Now, Korea will be the first Asian nation to be visited by Pope Francis during his visit, which comes from August 14th to the 18th. The pontiff will attend a Catholic youth festival and preside over a ceremony to beatify 124 Korean Catholic martyrs. But he could potentially do something much more significant. Dennis P. Halpin, a visiting scholar at the U.S. Korea Institute at John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, says the Pope could use his visit to stand in solidarity with Korea's surviving comfort women by arranging a meeting with them. The Pope will be here on August 15th, which is the uh, a holy day of obligation for the Roman Catholic Church, the feast of the Assumption of Mary into heaven, and a date of symbolic ascendancy for all women. It's also important as it's Korea's Independence Day, which is when the Korean women forced into sexual slavery by the Japanese military were freed. Over in Japan now, and the, the Liberal Democratic Party and their coalition party, New Komeito, appear to be set to approve a draft statement saying that Japan must meet three conditions before exercising its right to collective self-defense, which is the right to come to the military aid of an ally under attack. The first condition describes an attack on a nation with a very close relationship to Japan. The attack must pose a clear existential danger to Japan or undermine Japanese citizens' constitutional rights to life, liberty and happiness. The other two conditions restrict the military by saying there has to be no other way to protect the nation in question and its citizens and that the use of military action should be kept to a bare minimum. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has been pushing to allow the country to exercise its right to collective self-defense. The cabinet could vote on the measure as early as Tuesday. Back here in Korea and the nation's rival parties are gearing up for by-elections on July 30th, which could be crucial, especially after a round of local elections back in June produced no clear loser or winner, essentially a draw. The ruling Sanuri party and the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy will nominate candidates for 15 parliamentary seats that are up for grabs, and both parties are planning to bring out their political heavyweights for races in the capital Seoul and also in Gyeonggi-do province. But neither party has yet revealed the names of their candidates, possibly indicating that they're planning to wait to do so until just before the candidate registration deadline. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. Now, there are a number of changes afoot for Korea in the second half of the year. These cover everything from the basic pension system to social health care and, and health care. Uh, Shin Se-min gives us a rundown on some of the changes we can expect on the way. The government on Sunday issued a list of changes to 160 regulations and systems in 27 government departments. The list will be posted and distributed on central, local and municipal government websites starting Monday, and the changes will take effect in the second half of the year. The changes cover pensions for the elderly, more leave for working moms, and harsher punishments for child abusers. One of the changes is related to data collection and follows a series of major security breaches in recent months. 
The new rule bans public institutions and private enterprises from illegally collecting citizens' identification numbers. Institutions with security breaches will be fined up to 500,000 U.S. dollars, even if the data was collected legally. Another change has to do with the pension system. Elderly people over the age of 65 who are in the lower 70 percent income bracket will be granted a maximum basic pension of nearly 200 U.S. dollars a month starting in August. In the legal sector, starting in late September, child abusers will face stronger punishments. A child abuse victim will be isolated from his or her assailant, and for the first time, child abuse victims will be provided with legal counsel, previously only allowed for adult victims of sexual violence. Working women juggling home and work life who are the mothers of twins will be granted 30 extra days of maternity leave, giving them a four-month break. And in the agriculture sector, area of origin labeling for pork will be enforced to ensure safe distribution and improve epidemics prevention efforts. Shin Semin, Arirang News. Now, it's an extremely difficult task making sure spent nuclear fuel is stored safely. And it's a problem that's becoming particularly troublesome for Korea as storage facilities here in the country are nearing saturation point, in fact. And as our Paulie explains, time f f to find a solution is running out. When petroleum is burned, it releases carbon dioxide. But when coal briquettes are burned, you're left with ashes. Nuclear energy is similar to briquettes in this sense. When 100 kilograms of uranium is spent, the nuclear waste produced is almost equal in amount and it comes with radioactivity and extreme heat. So the fuel is stored in a nearby cistern and cooled. Their problem here in Korea is that some of these temporary facilities will be full to the brim in the next few years. These are the current levels at some plants. The Kodi nuclear plant in Pusan, the nation's oldest, stands at 70-70% capacity, Warsong at 75, Hanbit at 65, and Hanur at 62. Although the construction of new plants has given Korea some time to spare, experts say the deadline is 2024. Korea has a total of 23 nuclear plants and some 700 tons of spent fuel is produced each year. Without a solution in the next 10 years, the nuclear plants will have to be shut down and Korea will face the risk of a blackout. The construction of interim storage facilities is currently being considered as the most plausible solution. As there is a master plan to permanently dispose of or reprocess spent fuel, I believe a time frame needs to be clarified for the construction of interim storage facilities. Some 20 countries worldwide operate interim storage facilities. An independent committee was formed last year and is seeking advice and ideas from experts. They plan to decide on how to deal with the issue by the end of the year. Paul Yi, Arirang News. Sales of imported cosmetics in Korea are falling, but more affordable domestic brands are going in the other direction, in fact. And it's not only because of the economic downturn. Our Son Jung-in explains the other factors that are in play. Korean cosmetic brands have long been a favorite in overseas markets, but for some time, Koreans were far more interested in buying imported luxury brands. But the tide appears to be turning. Sales of imported cosmetics increased steadily from early 2000 until their peak in 2009 at 26 percent of the market share. However, in the time since, the figure has been on the decline, dropping to 23 percent last year. Domestic brands have been filling the gap, with the market share rising from 47 percent in 2008 to 57 percent last year. Market analysts attribute this turn events to several factors, one being the rise in dermatology clinics. Competition in the saturated market has prompted clinics to cut the cost of treatment procedures by as much as two-thirds. That means more people from all walks of life are visiting on a regular basis for their skin care needs, which is making them less reliant on cosmetics. And as such, customers have become smarter and choosier about which products they use on their faces. That's caused them to lean more on high-quality, low-price products they can trust, 
namely Korean-made cosmetics. Popular brand stores like Innisfree, The Face Shop and Misha have doubled their sales in recent years. Considering the increased number of people visiting dermatology clinics and the high quality that domestic skin brands provide, the latest trend is not expected to turn around anytime soon. Chun Jung-in, Arirang News. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following on this Monday morning. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim, standing by at the News Centre. Good morning, Eunice. And good morning to you, Mark. Rescue teams are shifting through rubble in India after two buildings collapsed, one after the other, on Saturday. More than 100 people are still fear trapped in a construction site of an 11 story tower, including scores of workers believed to have been at the basement when it collapsed near Chennai, the capital of Tamil Nadu state. At least five construction company officials were detained Sunday as part of a police investigation. Earlier in New Delhi, a rundown four story building had toppled over, killing 10 people, including two children. Officials suspect construction work at an adjoining building could be to blame. Building collapses are becoming a common occurrence in India driven by high demand, a lack of construction codes, poor quality building materials and corruption. Fierce fighting is underway in Tikrit as Iraqi forces try to retake the northern city from Sunni militants that captured it nearly 20 days ago. Airstrikes against rebel positions were launched as ground troops were dispatched. They faced a number of improvised explosive devices and stiff resistance. There are reports the insurgents also shot down a helicopter and took its pilot into custody. Meanwhile, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant formally declared the creation of an Islamic caliphate. A spokesman in an internet audio posting called on all those living in areas under the group's control to swear allegiance to its declared leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. ISIL militants, with the help of other Sunni fighters, have seized much of northern Syria and neighboring Iraq. A series of churches were attacked and burned down on Sunday in Nigeria. Suspected Boko Haram militants stormed at least three churches, The Guardian reports, killing dozens of men, women and children near Chibok. Residents said about 20 men in a truck and motorcycles drove into town armed with bombs and guns. There is no definitive figure on the number of casualties. A state of emergency is in place in northern Nigeria following near daily raids by suspected Boko Haram militants who have killed hundreds in recent months in the name of creating an Islamic state. U.S. President Barack Obama will seek some $2 billion in emergency funds to address a noted surge in illegal child migration from Central America. More than 52,000 unaccompanied children entering the U.S. have been taken into custody since October, striking what's being called an urgent humanitarian situation. The White House says it will make the request in a letter to Congress on this Monday. Obama will also ask for legal authorities to apply fast-track deportation procedures and apply stiffer penalties to those who smuggle children across the border. And a good Monday morning to you all as we kick things off with our 2014 Brazil World Cup action. Starting off with an exciting match which took place earlier today, the Netherlands taken on Mexico. Let's take a look at the highlights. That started rather slow with both sides scoreless after the first half, but Giovanni Dos Santos scores the first goal of the match, giving Mexico the 1-0 lead. Mexico had it in the bag, but Wesley Snyder in the 88th minute finds the back of the net for the equalizer. Now the match looked like it was going to extra time, but a penalty is called in the dying seconds of the match as Huntelar scores the game winner, helping the Netherlands advance to the quarterfinals with a 2-1 win. Meanwhile, with Greece taking on Costa Rica currently in the second half, Costa Rica up 1-0. 
And now let's take a look at the exciting finishes from the previous day, including Brazil and Chile, who fought hard till the end. Of course, take a look at here. A couple of first half goals had both sides tied at one apiece, and even after the extra time, and there was no winner. But some dramatic penalty as several key spot kicks led to Neymar scoring the deciding kick here as he hosts Nations advance with a 3-2 penalty victory. Meanwhile, Uruguay without Luis Suarez didn't look threatening at all as Colombia's James Rodriguez scores twice in this match, helping Colombia win it 2-0. Of course, after their 1-0 loss to Belgium last week, Korea has actually really recently, uh, just recently returned to Korea at the Incheon International Airport. Of course, I'll have more updates on that. But, of course, Korea's World Cup hopes came to an end rather early. It wasn't the best of time for the players in Brazil, but there were three stars who really shined and proved to have raised their value on the team. And while many of the players were criticized for their lack of form during the World Cup, three players on the team were praised and were considered the bright stars on the squad. And there were Kim Shinuku, who proved to be the best striker on the team, and there was Lee Gun Ho, came back to the squad after being left off in 2010 and was probably the best player on the squad despite coming off the bench. And after this World Cup, the future of Korea's goalkeeping was finalized as Kim Sung-gyu proved to be the better and younger goalkeeper ahead of Chung sung yong And now finishing things off, we continue on with our ever-so-controversial biting incident of Luis Suarez, who has, of course, been suspended for his actions against Giorgio Chiellini last week. Because now, according to a report, it might not have been his third offense, but his... Eighth. According to England's Daily Star, Luis Suarez during his youth football days bit five other players on the pitch. It's of course when he was just 14 years of age. Now the report added that those previous incidents were also reported to FIFA and that the four-month ban was not enough to punish the star. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning, I'm Lee ji with your weather update. It surely was a soupy weather over the weekend and for today, we're going to have a similar weather pattern as yesterday with a chance of sporadic showers in the central region and eastern parts of the peninsula during the day. And the thunder and lightning can be ruled out. So it seems like we have lousy afternoon ahead of us today, but the temperature will continue to be on the warm side. Highs will be hovering over 30 degrees Celsius across the region. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the reading for today. The morning low here in Seoul is starting out at 20, then the high in the capital and Daegu will rise to 30, while Gwangju will soar to 31 and Busan should make it to 27 this afternoon. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like down on Jeju and Daejeon should see a high of 27 and 30 respectively. Dukdo will reach 22, while Mount Kungang hikes up to 18. Well, that's all for Korea, and here's the international weather for viewers around the world.
OK, well, those are the stories we have for you at this hour. But Korea Today is coming up with more news in about half an hour's time. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.